Hello. Today we are going to be discussing the Industrial Revolution, which began in Europe and then spread throughout the world, uh, starting in about 1750 in Britain. Now, you need eight things to be able to have an Industrial Revolution. So we're going to look at each of those things that you need to come together to be able to have your society industrialized. So we're going to start with coal. Coal was first mined in China because everything started in China, uh, starting around 500 BC, uh, and it was used for heating. Uh, then it comes to the Netherlands in the 1500s and Britain a century later, and it starts to replace wood as a fuel source. You know, Britain is not a small island and people have lived there for thousands of years and they've slowly cut down all the trees and they're running out of wood. So in the 18th century, they start burning coal instead of wood. Uh, and to show just how it grew in 1700, uh, 2.5 million tons of coal were mined in Britain. And 115 years later, it was 16 million tons mined. So you can see that the demand went up and, and the technology that allowed them to uh, per, you know, mine coal more efficiently uh, just got better. It was very heavy. It was very hard to move uh, from the mine. And so, you know, you need some form of transportation to be able to actually start moving it around your country. Uh, it smells nasty uh, when you burn it. And uh, the mine, the mining activity is very hazardous. Uh, subsurface water was one of the biggest problems where you're digging and suddenly you hit the, the water table and it floods the mine and everyone dies. Uh, some of the things that improved that though were steam powered pumps you know, to pump the water out of the coal mine. Uh, and then also uh, the growth of a railroad transportation network to be able to move the coal all across the country. The next thing you need is iron. Uh, iron had been produced for a very long time, uh, but it was all produced at the at the village level. You're not producing for industry, you're producing for your local community, the things that you need uh, that, that must be made out of metal. Uh, you know, producing iron is it's very complex and you need a lot of capital to be able to get it going and it's very labor intensive iron is obviously very heavy and difficult to transport so you need a transportation network again to be able to move stuff around um one of the, the one of the advancements that allowed there to be more iron to be produced was uh coming actually out of the coal mines there was a waste byproduct of coal called coke uh, nothing to do with the soda, uh, and it was used in the production of iron. Of iron, so you know if you have more mining, then you're going to have more coke, and if you have more coke, then you're going to be able to produce more iron. And when you get into the middle of the 18th century, you have the Seven Years' War, and there's a great need for more iron, right, to be able to fight that war. So the British are producing 17,000 tons of iron in 1740, and by 1806, you can see it's quite a bit more, 256,000 tons. Uh, you know, outside of the wartime effort, most of the iron went into the cotton industry, actually. You also need technological advancements when you are trying to create an industrial revolution. So uh, one of the most important things that comes along right in this period is steam power. Uh, the steam engine had actually been around, you know, since uh, Roman times. Uh, a Roman thinker kind of figured out the steam engine, but they had no need for machine power because they had all of the power that they needed coming from slave labor. So there are different versions. China had a version for a while, but but James Watt, this Englishman, is the guy who kind of perfected the, the steam engine to be used in industry as well as in transportation. So you get steam powered looms, right? So you can produce a lot more textiles. You get steam turbines uh, starting in the, latter, the late 19th century that will produce electricity. Um, you know, before uh, iron, before the Industrial Revolution, everything that was built was built out of wood or stone, right? So you need to advance beyond that. Uh, the textile industry was really changed by this machine called the spinning jenny, which helped produce large amounts of textiles. Uh, in order to be able to produce textiles, you need raw cotton, you know, and so we've seen in other videos that you start to have cotton production in both the United States and more intensified cotton production going on in 
India. There are new ways of making steel, right? So taking iron and adding additional materials to create steel. It's called the Bessemer steel process. Uh, and it really dramatically increases the amount of steel that's produced in the 19th century. Uh, obviously, you have to have a railroad system to make any of this stuff work. Uh, you need advancements in communications. And we start to see that in the 19th century. And then by the late uh, 19th century, as we said, you start to get electrification. Uh, and uh, electricity becomes a huge factor uh, as we move into the 20th century, which is you know, technically outside of the period known as the Industrial Revolution. You also need advancements in transportation technology, right? The railroad is critical because you need something that can move really heavy stuff over long distances. You can do that by sea. You can do that uh, in water routes as well, but then you have to be able to you know, build new canals to, to do that. So you have to you have to modernize the roads, right? Because some of the roads were literally left over from the Roman Empire. Um, shows how good the Romans were at building uh, roads. But you definitely want to have roads that are capable of taking heavier loads uh, than was possible in the early 18th century. Clearly, you also need labor. You need a workforce. You need the people to go and actually work in the factories uh, and produce the materials that, that make the Industrial Revolution happen. Um, the, the workforce is terribly uh, exploited, treated very, very poorly up until about the turn of the 20th century. Uh, really terrible working conditions. These people move to the cities uh, to escape conditions in the countryside and to find new opportunities. Uh, and so you have this, you know, largely kind of expendable workforce. There's no need to put in workforce safety regulations or anything like that. Um, and also the, the people who own the factories try to keep workers from being able to organize and form what we start calling trade unions by the end of the 19th century. But at least in Britain, by the mid 1800s, there were some efforts to uh, stop some of the worst abuses around child labor and things like that. And so officially, no children under nine could work in any factories, although it definitely still happened on a pretty regular basis. Uh, and women and children were theoretically limited to a 10 hour workday. Now, people are moving out of the countryside and into the cities to go and work in the factories, which means there are fewer people working on food production. And so that can't happen. Fewer people working in the fields and many more people in the cities who need the food without agricultural improvements as well. So you see uh, countries start to try to reclaim land that was uh, not usable for uh, farming, so like filling in marshes, things like that. Uh, they also uh, started planting in like very neat straight rows. It used to just be you, you know, to kind of dig some some trenches and then just sort of throw the seeds everywhere. So it's much more efficient if you have them in very neat rows. Now the the agricultural revolution that we're talking about it really only happened in. Uh, Britain and the Netherlands, because a lot of Eastern Europe uh, had serfdom, so there was really no uh, need. Uh, they also didn't very, have very much industry. There was no need for, um, you know, to have more efficient methods of growing food. And then, you know, you also have the French Revolution that's happening at right around the same time, and that's an incredibly disruptive uh, experience for France. And in addition to labor and agriculture, you just need more people. You need more people to have a really efficient, successful industrial revolution. So if we look just at the UK, because that's where the industrial revolution uh, started, uh, in 1700, you had 5.5 million people. And in 1850, you have 18 million people. Now, that's still a pretty small number by today's standards. But if you just look at the rate of growth over 150 years, it's pretty significant. Um, some of the factors included a declining death rate. Uh, you also have more food production because you have more efficient agricultural methods. Uh, and so you have fewer people dying of starvation. And then actually starting after 1850, you get people thinking about uh, something that they call germ theory, which we would call modern medicine. Uh, just the idea that, hey, maybe you shouldn't do surgery with dirty hands, things like that. Um, you have more people, but you have fewer farmers. So, you know, again, as we've said, the agricultural system has to be more efficient. Um, 
you know, you also have science and technology and as science and technology spreads and people are looking at new ways of doing things, uh, you're more successful and that's going to decrease death rates and it's also going to increase population. Uh, and then if we just look at the population of the world overall, uh, it you know, 8,000 BCE, sort of the beginnings of, uh, of what we would call civilization, you had about 10 million people on Earth. And then you fast forward to 1750, and you've increased to 800 million. So that's, you know, an 80 fold increase. Uh, and then you go to 1830 and it's a billion and then it's 1930 it's two billion so the rate of population growth really starts to pick up speed starting around the year 18 but it's not enough to have a larger population you have to get the population to an area where then you can put them in factories and have them work and this ends up being cities um you know prior to about the year 1800 or you know the cities were very different they had walls they had uh charters that they got from a king to be able to operate autonomously. But by 1800, we start to really see these mega cities in Europe, London, Paris, Amsterdam. Uh, by 1850, you have New York uh, in the United States. And so these become places where you concentrate people to be able to work in your factories. And as more cities develop based around specific industries, those cities just sort of end up specializing. So there's a city in Northern England called Sheffield that is sort of the steel city for Britain. Our steel city, it's Pittsburgh. Or if you think about like Detroit and its association with cars. So that, that notion that a whole city would kind of be built around a particular industry and by 1900, 75% of the people who lived in Britain lived in a city. So you see this emptying of uh, the countryside in a massive shift over about 150 years uh, with regards to where people live. Uh, the cities were not necessarily great places to live. There was crime. They were heavily polluted. Um, coal is really bad for the environment. It might possibly be the worst possible fossil fuel you can burn, uh, and it leaves a dusty residue all over the area where you're burning it. So, you know, the cities are coated in dust. It's like super gross. Um, and, you know, you occasionally will have a revolt here or there because the working conditions in the factory or the mine or whatever are just so awful. We're going to move on now and look at some of the socioeconomic uh, aspects and consequences of the Industrial Revolution. The old societal order that existed in Europe for a thousand years collapsed as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So for the previous thousand years, society was, put, was, was split into three orders, the clergy, the nobility, and the peasantry. And the whole concept was based around cooperation. Everybody has their job and everyone is dependent upon the other. So the peasantry does the bulk of the work, uh, they do all of the farming, they provide the food and so forth. Nobility provides security and protection, and the clergy provides for, you know, the eternal spirit and all that kind of thing. Um, and so this was a, it was a symbiotic relationship. The Industrial Revolution comes along, and those orders are replaced by classes. And this you've probably heard of, upper class, middle class, and working class. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, the Enlightenment ideas start to change society. Uh, we start to see revolutions. We start with the American Revolution, then the French Revolution has a huge impact on Europe. We also shift over to market economics, and competition replaces cooperation. So classes are competing against one another. There's conflict. And the working class, which we're going to re be referring to as the proletariat when we look at a lot of this stuff, the proletariat accuses the bourgeoisie. If you recall, the bourgeoisie are the, the urban city folk. They're wealthy, but they're not nobility. The proletariat accuses the bourgeoisie of class warfare, and the bourgeoisie accuse the proletariat of being enemies of progress. <laughs> 
Economics also changes quite a bit during this period. We shift from just simple trade between a couple of individuals to commerce. Uh, the difference there is that you have a middleman. So, for example, if I'm buying my produce directly from you, then we're engaged in a, in a direct trade. But as soon as I sell my produce to somebody else who then puts it on a truck and takes it to another place to sell. Now we're talking about commerce because there's a middleman, right? The middleman buys my stuff and then sells it to somebody else at a markup, meaning that the, the way they make their money is off of charging more than what they bought. And if you add more middlemen, quickly commerce can become global. You can have uh, somebody sell a Ming vase in China and it goes through a few different middlemen and then arrives in France at a significantly marked up price because of how many middlemen needed to get their cut of the of the profits. Um, the producers no really no longer really producing for themselves. They're producing for this abstract thing called the market, right? And the market has its own forces, but you're no longer producing stuff and saying like, okay, I'm going to make this and I'm going to give it to Bob. You're not giving it to Bob anymore. Now you're selling it on the market and then lots of different people might be buying your stuff. Another thing that comes along with commerce is modern banking. We've talked about banking being around for for centuries, um, but it helps to organize capital. And in 1750, kind of right at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution, there are only 12 banks in Britain that were outside of the city of London. But 65 years later, in 1815, there were 900 banks outside of, a Lon of London. So that just shows how as manufacturing grows and urbanization grows, banks have to go with it to be able to help organize that capital. Uh, and the bankers ultimately are working with industrialists to their advantage. Capitalism. Uh, what is capitalism? You live in a capitalistic society. What does that actually mean? So capitalism is driven by capital. And capital is anything that holds value. So, for example, land. I buy a piece of land. I put my money into it. Then I hold it for a long time. Then I sell it. And hopefully I sell it for a profit. Right. And then, you know, that's I've stored my the value in the land. You can do it. Obviously, gold is capital. Money is capital. Uh, you can even have things like potentially toys being capital, because if you buy a toy and you hold on to it and then you sell it five or 10 years down the road and you make a profit, then you you have stored value in that toy and that toy is capital right so there's a lot uh, the ideas can be capital uh, the sort of guy most opposed to capitalism though is Karl Marx uh, and Karl Marx identified the bourgeoisie as the people who were sort of most important in the development of industrial society and he doesn't mean that's a good thing um, he thinks that if the workers could get all of the elements of production then they would be able to rule themselves and this is his ideas become uh, communism uh, eventually you also have another thinker who is kind of more of a capitalist and that's Adam Smith, and he's really kind of the first modern economist, and he believed in something called the invisible hand, meaning that the market kind of regulates itself. And the reason why the market regulates itself is because people are all looking for their own selfish interests, right? Everyone wants to go and make more money. And so his argument was that the combination of everyone's selfish decisions leads to collective profit. Uh, I, I think that there might be a lot of people in society today that could have a vigorous debate with Adam Smith about whether or not that that's true. Um, but, you know, we live in a capitalistic society and in a capitalistic society, oh, those economic relations are managed by the people who control the means of production, right? The people who own the corporations, right? They're the ones who are sort of directing the economy along with government. But they, they command the labor force, but they also decide upon what you get as a consumer. There's a famous story that Henry Ford, when he first started producing the Model T, somebody said, what color, you know, what color does it come in? And he said, you can have whatever color you want as long as you want black, right? So he's choosing there. Um, there's another form of capitalism called agrarian capitalism, and this is the process by which small-scale individual farms are replaced by large-scale farming interests. And you're, again, you're no longer just farming to give food to your local community. You're farming for the market. You're producing a crop that you're then selling on the market.
So Robert Owen is a really important figure in the early part of the Industrial Revolution because he's really the first socialist. He starts out as a younger person, as an industrialist. He owned textile mills, but after buying them and spending some time in them, he was really horrified by the conditions they're in. And he was one of the first people who said, well, we're not going to do child labor anymore. Uh, it, it was still legal in society, but he said, we're not, I'm not going to do that anymore. He thought that education was incredibly important. He wanted to be able to provide better living conditions for his workers, even though it ended up costing him money. Uh, he denounced the clergy. He said that they were sort of involved in this whole process of, of suppressing people. Uh, and he saw a lot of injustice in society. And you know, he was a guy who was in favor of women's rights in the early 19th century. So that, that puts him in pretty rare company. And what his ideal is that all people would kind of organize themselves into little self-sufficient communities that look quite a lot like the peasant villages that had existed in, you know, all across Europe for you know, 2,000 years. Uh, and he couldn't get it done in England because England was already pretty industrialized and there wasn't a lot of space for that anymore. So he moved to Indiana and he, he sets up one of these self-sufficient communities and you can see the image there on the slide. Uh, he thought that America was going to be the place where his ideas were going to come true. They didn't. We're a capitalistic society. Eventually, he moves back to Europe and, and creates the first labor union in the 1830s. It's not successful, but he at least starts laying the blueprint. Um, but his sons all became Americans, and one of them even ended up in the United States Congress. The United Kingdom was the first country to like fully go through the process of industrialization. And so we're going to look in some more detail at exactly how Britain was transformed. So for starters, while France was having their French Revolution and they were, you know, there's a lot of violence in their society, Britain was across the English Channel there developing its own industry. Uh, there was conflict between the bourgeoisie and the government in France, but in Britain they actually worked closely together and they wanted to remake society because it would be in the best interests of both government and, uh, you know, the bourgeoisie. Uh, the Industrial Revolution does create profound changes in British society. You see most people leave the villages that their families had lived in for centuries and move into the cities. Uh, so, And then the living conditions dramatically decrease in those cities. And the social organization is kind of ripped apart and has to be rebuilt over you know, many, many decades. This was a great period of stability in terms of the government for Great Britain. They only had two kings between 1780 and 1830. So that creates a remarkable amount of consistency throughout that period. And they also, for most of that time, only had two prime ministers. So it's a very stable government, which means you're not having to deal with a lot of political upheaval while you're also completely reorganizing the economy. The British Empire existed for commerce and pretty much nothing else. The British did not have an inherent desire to conquer and rule over people all across the country. They kind of kept stumbling into doing that, but that wasn't their main mission. Their main mission was to make money and to open markets. And so that's what their foreign policy was kind of built all around. Um, that's why they felt, you know, sea power was more important than anything else for them. They also controlled the slave trade in the Atlantic and made a lot of money off of that. Uh, and they used this national debt system for financing. This is where you sell bonds and you raise money and then you slowly pay people back over a very long period of time. Um, this worked to the advantage of the upper class in Britain, though, because not only did they have political control by, you know, controlling the House of Lords, but they also were the ones that bought most of that debt. And so... They have economic control over the government. They have political control over the government. And that works really, really well for them. They also promoted something that Adam Smith really believed in, which was called laissez-faire. Laissez-faire is French. It means, uh, you know, hands off. And the idea there is that you, you don't let government mess around with the markets because government messes up the markets whenever they, they, they get involved. And, you know, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, but that is a a belief amongst uh, big business that continues to this day.
During this period, we do see the death of the peasant village, which had been the backbone of society for over a thousand years. Uh, you know, we, we these three orders are present in the image there. So, you know, the church represents the clergy and the manor house represents the nobility and the peasant village and the pastures uh, and the fields represent uh, the peasantry. And so you have this, like I said, symbiotic relationship between all of them uh, and the villagers all farm that land collectively. So they don't all have their own individual plots that just belong to, you know, Joe over here. They, they, they farm it all collectively. They share in what comes out of the fields. They of course pay some of their taxes with that. They give some, of course, to the church and to the, into the, you know, the Lord of the particular little area. Peasant life was about subsistence. You grew just enough to be able to survive and pay your taxes. Life was very different than life today because it was completely dictated by nature. So in the summer, you stayed up later because the sun was out longer than it is in the winter. And you did a lot more work in the summer and the fall with the harvest than you did in the winter because it was cold and you couldn't actually grow anything in the winter. And so you just sort of sat around. As population increases, though, that actually makes life worse because you don't have more seeds. And if you don't have more seeds, you're not going to be able to produce as much food. And because there's more demand for those seeds, the prices are going to go up. And so more people without more food does not equal happiness. That equals starvation. Um, but by 1840, we see this communal farm structure is pretty much gone. It had been gradually disappearing for almost 100 years, and it's pretty much out by then. And the old system is replaced with estates, right, which is very similar to a plantation in like pre-Civil War American South. And instead of having individual peasants, you have tenant farmers. So you, you pay them, but the, the conditions are certainly no better and a lot of times worse than when you had the free peasantry. But the most, most of the people actually end up leaving these small villages and moving to the cities and gradually becoming a part of the workforce. Um, but the workforce isn't just the work, the laborers. It's also the customers, right? Think about if you like work at Walmart. If you work at Walmart, the chances are that you're also going to shop at Walmart. So while Walmart is paying you to work there, they're also charging you for stuff. And so they're getting some of their money back. And the same system was in the case in once the peasantry left the countryside and moved into the cities. The image is sort of uh, kind of an iconic image of England that some people find very romantic. The little green lines are called hedgerows and they divide those different spaces. And people seem to think that that's super charming, but it's actually relatively recent and it's not charming at all because what it represents is wealthy landowners who buy up land from the peasants who couldn't pay their taxes anymore. And then they put up these hedges and those hedges are designed to keep the the peasantry out of the land that used to belong to them. And once the wealthy people take over that land, they actually, they stop using it to grow grain. They start using it for agrarian capitalism. So they're using it for shepherding or they're using it to grow, you know, some sort of crop for export or something like that. This was devastating to the villages. It was ruinous. It was the reason why you start to see large numbers of people moving to the cities because once that land is gone, you cannot survive. You just do not have enough land left to be able to feed all of the people in the village. And so that collapses. Uh, the fact that Parliament was was in control of the wealthy people, they then passed laws that made it easier to grab peasant land. So there was really this active effort to subvert that peasant village and, and effectively destroy it. Obviously, the backbone of the Industrial Revolution is the factory. And a factory is simply anything that combines human labor with some form of, of mechanical power. Could be electric, could be steam, uh, could be water, uh, but it, that's, that's, it's that combination. You need a large number of workers. You also have to have something called division of labor. And what division of labor is, is uh, back in the peasant village, you would have perhaps one person who would spin the wool into thread and then weave the thread into cloth and then 
uh, you know, design the shirt, cut out the pattern, and then sew it all together, and now you have a garment. In a factory, each of those jobs is going to be done by a different group of people. So you've got some people who are uh, creating the thread, you have some people who are doing the weaving, and so forth, right? Uh, you have very close supervision of the workers. Uh, the working conditions were absolutely terrible, uh, particularly in the cotton mills. Uh, they were massive, large, complex buildings. Uh, the conditions were worse than those in coal mines where people have to deal with flooding and poison gas and darkness and terrible stuff. Um, cotton textiles were incredibly important and valuable for the British Empire. They were half of all of the exports from the United Kingdom in 1830. Uh, just to give you an example, in 1796, they were producing 21 million cubic yards, and by 1830, they're producing 347 million cubic yards. So that's a huge jump for 34 years, and it just shows how much money the British were making off of the textile industry. Um, most people who worked in the textile mills were women or children. Uh, before you start to have workplace safety, uh, laws, you could have children as young as three years old working in a factory, which is kind of insane to think about. But frequently, people who are five or six years old are going to be working. Needless to say, you have an incredibly high child mortality rate if you have a three-year-old wandering around in you know a cotton mill it's gonna not end well uh, workers could be tortured they could be chained to the device on which they work because there's no laws that prohibit these capitalists from treating their workers like that family life changes dramatically because of the Industrial Revolution, and there's this huge split between the life of the working class people living in cities and the bourgeoisie, and you can see examples of images there on the right. Uh, working class women and children are going to be working in factories. Women might also be working in the domestic service. That's like, um, you know, being a maid or a cook in the home of a wealthy person. Um, men did in tend to be underemployed, though, uh, and that becomes a huge problem because the peasant family had, for over a thousand years, perhaps even longer, had been oriented around uh, the male being the, the, the father being the dominant person in the household. And you see, for a lot of younger women in particular, the foreman in the factory starts to take on that role of, I'm telling you what to do. And so, you know, with men being underemployed, that could lead to more crime, uh, a lot of alcoholism, domestic abuse. Uh, it was really sort of a terrible situation. On the other hand, though, you have the bourgeoisie. And the bourgeoisie uh, they were doing okay for that period. They were their families were close knit. They were still very focused on well, fo focused on children for sure, but but built around uh, the father. The family is incredibly patriarchal. Um, you know, bourgeois children didn't have to go and work. They got to grow up and get an education and all that kind of stuff. And and ultimately the bourgeoisie family of the of the 19th century is sort of the model of the middle class family of the 20th century. And so, you know, we still see that pattern existent in the family structures that we have in society today. Needless to say, most of the common people were not thrilled about everything that was happening in their society. Uh, the pro proletariat would sometimes go into cotton mills and destroy the looms, and they would also riot against uh, cheap Irish labor. They brought Irish people over from Ireland to work in the factories because they could pay them less. Uh, that gives you an idea of how things, how bad things were in Ireland at the time. You had uh, people called Luddites, and the Luddites are people who are uh, mindlessly opposed to change and that concept of Luddism and there are still Luddites in in the world today um, anybody who like still can't figure out how to find the settings on their phone that would probably be someone who's kind of a Luddite uh, after the Napoleonic War though things get even worse though because you know you have an economic depression you have a whole bunch of soldiers who had been fighting over in Europe they come home so that's going to drive up unemployment even further you have mechanization say, some of the same stuff we're dealing with today with regards to automation you had during the early part of the Industrial Revolution with mechanization. If you have these giant looms, then you don't have as many people who are you know, working as they would be working uh, by hand in their peasant uh, villages. You have severe income inequality 
such as you do today. And whenever income inequality gets bad enough, you sometimes get revolution. Um, you know, people felt dispossessed from the land. You know, they had been driven out of the peasant village or perhaps their parents or their grandparents were the ones that actually got driven out of the peasant village. And everybody's just kind of a laborer now. You used to have peasants and small businessmen and, and everyone's just a laborer now other than the, the wealthiest people who are then making money off of the labor of the common person. In fact, in England, they even passed a law making it illegal to be poor, which, uh, you know, that kind of also boggles the mind. Uh, but basically, they took anybody who said that they didn't have a job and they essentially put them in prison. And uh, they're called workhouses and they were actually forced to work. So it's like, hey, you can't find a job. So now we're going to throw you in jail and make you work for free. Now you have a job. Look at that. Uh, but, you know, families get separated, which obviously is a thing we're dealing with in society today. But it was really bad for the common people. Life, life expectancy was lower than that of like the prehistoric era in industrialized cities. But people are making a lot of money. And as a result of that, the Industrial Revolution inevitably ends up spreading. So you can see here uh, the, the, the pace of spread. So by the 1840s, most of Britain has been industrialized. Uh, by the 1850s, it's spread into the low countries. But it takes almost 50 or 60 years to get all the way into Eastern Europe. And a lot of the spread is because uh, people from Europe come and visit English factories and they're like, ooh, this is great. We're going to be able to make more money. And then they head over there. Um, it, it took off uh, more easily in some areas than others, though. The first place on the continent where it really took off was in the Netherlands. And certain aspects of the Industrial Revolution actually did start in the Netherlands, but at a pretty primitive level. Uh, the Dutch had been merchants and seafarers for hundreds and hundreds of years. Uh, in 1602, they set up the Dutch East India Company. Uh, so they're very big on those joint stock companies. Uh, the, the Dutch East India Company carried half of the world's trade in the, in the 1600s. The, the Netherlands had the highest standard of living in the 1600s. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with trade. They don't have any agriculture. It's a, well, not any, but they have very little agriculture. It's a very small country, uh, compared to France or Great Britain or Germany later on. Uh, they have a lot of different industries though. And so you can see how trade supports their economy, even though they don't have a ton of agriculture, they have the best standard of living in Europe. Uh, by 1500, already half of the population was urbanized. Now, again, we're talking about a small country, but it was a heavily urbanized country. And, you know, they got things going with the Industrial Revolution a little bit in the in the 1500s and the 1600s uh, by building better windmills. Uh, and windmills have tons of industrial uses uh, and they don't cause cancer, which is great. Uh, water pumps were also developed to help drain swamps and marshes. Uh, and those tended to be financed by wealthy merchants who, you know, t of course, then took control of the land that was kind of created by by getting rid of these swamps. Germany. Before Napoleon, Germany was completely disunited. It was the remains of the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, there were hundreds of little states. They all kind of were in competition with one another. So there are these trade barriers. You also had serfdom in the east. So you can't move labor around like you need to do to be able to have the Industrial Revolution. But a lot of things changed after Napoleon because he ended up reducing the number of German states from those hundreds to just 39, which is still a lot. But they were all dominated by Prussia, which was the largest of those uh, nations. And they, they actually created a customs union. So that way, trade could flow freely all across all of the little independent states that would eventually come together and form the country of Germany. So you had they had a massive industrial expansion uh, starting around 1830s. They had railroads long before France did. Uh, and there was, a just like in Britain, there was a pretty tight association between businesses and government. But in Germany, it's different because you had a lot of different governments. But what that ended up doing is that was also some of the glue that brought all those 39 little countries together to be able to eventually form uh, Germany. And it was, in fact, the most economically powerful nation by 1850, even though it wasn't technically a nation in 1850.
The situation is very different in France, though. Capitalism really struggled uh, before the French Revolution. There was a lot of overregulation. We had a highly centralized French state, and so you had a lot of red tape they had to cut through to be able to do anything. Plus, you also had the aristocrats skimming the profits, and so it becomes less profitable to uh, you know, engage in capitalism. Uh, they also didn't have some of those components that we looked at at the beginning of the lecture. For example, coal. They weren't mining coal to any great degree, Paris still burned wood for heat. In 1789, the average Parisian used two tons of wood, right? So you're burning through a resource that, if you're not being smart, isn't going to be renewed, and you're not taking advantage of coal. Not that burning coal is a good thing. It's the worst uh, fossil fuel, and the Industrial Revolution is a big part of why we have a terrible climate situation right now. But that's another lecture. Uh, you know, in France, there were these restrictions on being able to move capital, one of which were banks. Banks were much less willing to uh, offer loans. Uh, they were just too conservative. And so that that the fact that there was no relationship between industry and banking like there was in Great Britain did end up having an impact on the growth of capitalism and the growth of the Industrial Revolution. By the 1880s, two thirds of France is still farmland. So that's a lot less than a lot less industry than in the UK or Germany or the United States. And in fact, a lot of the uh, factories that did exist in France were owned by British capitalists. So the French really hadn't gotten their their society around capitalism or the Industrial Revolution. However, the United States did. The United States started industrializing fairly early in its history in the in the 1810s and 1820s. Uh, they were the, we were the main supplier of cotton to Europe until the Civil War. Of course, that's all coming from the South. Once the Civil War starts, uh, the Union is blockading all of the ports in the South, and so the Brits have to switch to India, and they end up building huge cotton plantations in India, and so now they're saving money, and this devastated the United States South because they lost their market after the war. So they lost everything in the war, and to boot, after the war, the British aren't buying their cotton anymore. And it's really not until the middle of the 20th century that the U.S. South is really able to start rebuilding its economy. Um, the United States also contributed to a massive expansion of global capital because of the gold rushes. Uh, obviously, California in 1849 was the first big one. And so now you've introduced a massive amount of gold into the global market, and that is capital. And so now capitalism and the Industrial Revolution are going to be able to even further expand because you have all this new gold coming from Canada, Alaska, uh, South Africa by the 1890s. But you then get these economic contractions when inflation gets too bad. So all throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, you have this mat. You know, it's like a it's like an accordion effect where the economy is great and then it collapses. It's great and it collapses. Uh, we, we're sort of caught in a cycle like that right now in the 21st century. But by 1900, the United States was a huge player in the global economy. We were the leading industry. We had more natural resources than anybody else. We had much more land than anybody else. We had more people than anybody else because of immigration. Immigration is a good thing, if you didn't know that. Uh, it adds laborers, but it also adds customers, right? We talked about that before. If you work at Walmart and you shop at Walmart, then there you go. You are both a laborer and a customer. So the factory owners realize that they're not treating the workers, most of whom are immigrants. They're not treating them well at all. Uh, but it's that massive flow of immigration that helps build the economy, Immigration is good for the economy. Uh, but outside of Europe and North America, industrialization really only happens in Argentina and Japan. And when we look at Japan in the 19th century, we'll see why that's uh, so significant. So looking at this map, we can see the approximate date of the beginning of industrialization. And I want you to pay attention to the purple and the pink uh, on this map, because if you are going to sort of point to the countries in the world today that have the strongest economies and the people ha are, are doing well, even in the middle of all of the stuff that's happening here in 2020, uh, it lines up with the United States and Northern Europe and Japan. Uh, that's not a coincidence. The fact that industrialization happened earlier in those places than in other places helps to explain the, the reason why 
Europe and America and to some extent also Japan are the dominant global players in the economy. Thank you for watching the entire video and feel free to take a look at any of the other videos on the channel.